And then there's this thing. There is this other thing. Uh, so this march is both an affirmation of the need for more projects like Cape Wind for Cape Wind itself, as well as a rejection of the dirty relics we have behind us here of, of power plants that when you burn the coal and natural gas in these facilities, uh, results in local air pollution that really harms the health of the local community and increases rates of asthma and leukemia and lung disease, um, as well as in its carbon dioxide, which threatens climate change, which means more superstorms like Sandy and Irene, more droughts, more hurricanes, more floods, more heat waves. Uh, it's just a really bad idea to, to continue using power like this when we know how to generate power, we know how to generate electricity without having to burn fossil fuels, without having to burn coal and natural gas. And so we're literally walking the walk along the transition that we'd like to see. We're, we're walking from coal to wind as we want our state to go from coal to wind and from gas to solar. Uh, so that, that's where we're calling for the governor to help lead and, and for the folks who are trying to stop Cape Wind. We have to put solar panels on every single rooftop that we can put them on. We have to go door to door and weatherize every single building to make our buildings more efficient and increase their insulation. We need to put wind turbines off our coasts and every single hilltop uh, in this country, and that's going to require a lot of labor. Uh, so we've got millions of people who are unemployed, and we have the jobs that they need to do waiting for them to solve this crisis. We just need the political will to say, let's take those people who want to work and put them to work, saving the future. Excellent. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Uh, my name is Craig Altimus. I'm the executive director of Better Future Project. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the health effects uh, that uh, coal generation produces? Absolutely. So when you burn coal, as with all fossil fuels, but coal is the dirtiest of them, uh, you emit things like mercury, uh, particulates, nitrous oxide, uh, lots of, of really bad things uh, into the air that people then breathe in. Uh, and that has a really harmful effect on human health. It increases rates of asthma, of lung disease, of cancer. Uh, it actually, the estimates are that about 20,000 Americans die every single year. Uh, from breathing in the pollution from power plants like Brayton Point. And it's just reprehensible that we continue to, to burn fossil fuels knowing those facts, uh, that, that people are going to get sick and people are going to die from this. And, and you know, as with all things, it, it affects the most vulnerable. Young children, uh, the elderly, those who are sick are more likely to fall ill and to die because of, of the activities of this power plant. And we, we just need to stop it. We're calling on Governor Patrick to provide the leadership that he can provide and to use the authority that has been given to him by the legislature under the Global Warming Solutions Act to move us beyond coal in a, in a permanent direction. And they used to divert the highway, the, the Route 6, and my mother would be driving me and my... We lived in Swansea, I went to school over in the North End of Fall River. I remember the road being changed. And, you know. Hey, would you guys mind moving up and, like, everybody move in? Good, that's good. Like, okay. Uh, we can get closer, we're all friends. Welcome to Energy Exodus March from Coal to Cape Wind. Um, really excited. I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, so we're going to start off with Executive Director and Founder of Better Future Project, Craig Altamos. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming out for what we hope will be a historic march. Um, as you all know, we, we have a pretty big crisis in front of us, uh, caused by a pretty big crisis behind us, the Brayton Point Power Station, which burns both coal and natural gas. And this station, along with a huge number of other power plants around the country and the world, are threatening human health in the communities that they are located in, and increasing rates of asthma, cancer, and lung disease. And the folks in Fall River know this intimately well, and we'll be hearing from a Somerset uh, resident who will speak to some of that. Um, but they also emit carbon dioxide, which as you know is causing climate change. Uh, and which means we're going to see a lot more superstorms like Sandy and Irene, more floods, more heat waves, more droughts. Uh, and we're really going to be threatening the conditions for life on Earth as we know it. Uh, we have a, a very, very delicate balance here uh, on this spaceship that we're, we're sailing through this universe in. Uh, and, and a very slight degree in temperature change can really fundamentally threaten our ability to grow food, uh, which is what really, really worries me, our access to, to food and water. Um, there are a number of projections that suggest that within the next 17 years, uh, between now and 2030, 
uh, 100 million people will die uh, from facilities like Brave Point around the world. 100 million people. That is a very large number. Unfortunately, that number is projected to increase beyond 2030. Most of those casualties, most of those sacrifices from burning coal, oil, and gas are due to the localized health effects that I referenced. But as we continue to burn these and we continue to throw our climate more and more out of whack, the death toll from climate is going to take an increasingly large toll. And some projections by scientists suggest that the casualty rate could be in the billions. Billions, with a B. The current top climate science advisor to the German government, which is a conservative government, suggests that there could be only enough food and water by the end of the century for one billion people on a planet that's projected to have nine billion by 2050. So believe me when I say that this is deadly serious. And we cannot allow that plant that kills people to exist for one day longer. But there's some good news in this too. The good news is that we know how to generate electricity without having to kill people. We know how to generate electricity without causing all these localized health effects, and we know how to generate electricity without causing climate change, which is why we're going to be marching from here to the Cape, right by the site of the nation's first offshore wind farm. As you know, as we go, we're going to go past a number of different places in New Bedford and Fairhaven and others where people are starting to lead the way toward the clean energy economy bringing real green jobs to the south coast of Massachusetts, which are direly needed. And we're going to have some great opportunities to get to know each other as well as we march. So I want to just leave you with our three uh, formal goals for this event. The first is asking Governor Patrick to close Brighton Point. lawsuits against this project. Yeah. We have every single permit we need for Cape Wind to be constructed. It's been cleared by every single level of government. But Bill Koch, a fossil fuel billionaire, an oil and gas billionaire, a member of the 1%, is suing to try to delay, 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 and obstruct the construction of the nation's first offshore wind farm. There are already 58 wind farms in Europe right now. That's right. 58. We have yet to build our first one because of this billionaire who thinks that he knows better than the rest of us what's good for the future of our country, or, or more accurately, what's good for the future of his pocketbook. But we're not going to stand for that. We're going to call on him to drop his lawsuit, and we're also going to call on the town of Barnstable to drop their lawsuit against Cape Wayne. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, Barnstable's town government initially was funding a lawsuit against Cape Wayne, and the people of Barnstable did not want to see their taxpayer dollars being wasted on this frivolous lawsuit. So they went to the town council meeting and got them to basically agree to stop spending money on this lawsuit. And then, lo and behold, an anonymous donor came through and has given over $350,000 to the town of Barnstable so that they could sue Cape Wayne so that we can keep Brayton Point burning coal for longer. That's not fair. That's not right. We're going to tell the Bartsville Town Council they need to drop that lawsuit right there in the Bartsville Town Square. But the third goal of this march relates to how we're going to win this thing. Because as much as we need to shut down this power plant and build Cape Wind, that's not going to be enough. We need to build a large, powerful social movement that can overcome the power of the Bill Cokes of the world make sure we get the renewable energy future that we deserve. Yeah. And so the third goal of this march is for all of you who have turned out today, and for the many more who will join us along the way, to build relationships with each other, 
to take the time to get to know each other as we march, to have those awkward conversations where you introduce yourself to someone you've never met before, and get to know them because we're going to need those relationships to carry us forward as we do this work. Because that's how we're going to win this thing, by having more and more people dedicate their lives the way you all have chosen to be out here today when there are plenty of other places you could have been. We need more people like you making these decisions, and we all know that there are times where you feel isolated and alone in this work, so you're going to need a support network, and we really encourage you as we march together to take the time to get to know your fellow marchers. Don't just stick to those that you already have met or are already friends with, but really be bold and be courageous and talk to new folks so we can build the movement we need to win the future for all of us. March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and it isn't a coincidence that we're starting the march today, um, today, and we're still in the struggle for, for jobs and freedom. Freedom from toxic pollution, freedom from the same struggles that Martin Luther uh, King spoke about on that day. In fact, the NAACP, who mobilized for this 50th anniversary, has declared Brayton Point behind me as the 14th worst power plant in the country in terms of environmental justice. In their report called Cold Blooded, Putting Profits Before People, they state clearly that coal is killing low-income people and people of color. Coal burning is and always has been deadly, and there is no proven technology that can clean coal. The entire coal energy cycle, from mining to combustion, to the disposal of coal ash is harmful to our communities. So we're here to continue that march all the way to the Cape and to continue the struggle for economic justice. Growing up in this region, we not only suffered the environmental costs of environmental injustice, we've been struggling through economic injustice for decades. Since the 1920s, we've been in an economic depression. And Martin Luther King noted, he recognized that the struggle for, against segregation was the first part of the struggle. He talked about how our struggle is for genuine equality, which means economic equality. For we know that it isn't enough to integrate lunch counters. What does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he can't earn enough to buy a cup of coffee? So we're here. demand a just transition to a, a new kind of economy, a fair economy with good jobs, union jobs, jobs that we can have a pension, have retirement, raise our families, send our families to, to uh, school, um, be able to own a house, not go into foreclosure. And that struggle con continues. And I would, I would ask the same question, you know, it's more than just the technological change we're talking about. We're talking about how we treat each other. We can't allow for a profit system to create unstable economics locally. We need ecological uh, sustainability. We need economic sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. I was concerned about people not being able to, to live out that dream if they couldn't afford it. We want to make sure that people have a human right to affordable utility rates. I work at the George Wiley Center in Rhode Island. Tens of 35,000 people get shut off every year because of utility costs. So we're in this for economic, environmental justice, and social justice. This is our new cutting edge movement that's bringing together a movement of movements. So I'm excited that you're here to walk through the cities of Fall River, these mills that were bustling that people organize for their own uh, well-being to get better rates and you're right get, get better working conditions and right now you're you're our voice you're helping build a new movement that's going to shift the economy that's going to shift energy and I'm a community organizer and a lot of times 
during organizing trainings, I ask people what power is. And most often, people talk about power being something that's negative, right? Because we look around us and we see power that's polluting. We see power over each other. We see decisions continually being made that we don't have a voice in. But that's not the way it has to be, right? We can have a different kind of power, and we're building that type of power right now. We're building the type of people power that's going to change the way that we live in the future, that's going to change the way we breathe, which is going to change the way our children are able to play. You know, I, I talk about my nieces and nephews in Somerset that I have to see use inhalers to be able to play, right? And we don't want a future like that. We don't want a future where we wonder if our relatives are dying of cancer because the energy that we're producing. We want a better future. You know, like Craig's organization is a better future. We want to build that better future together. And this is how we're going to do it, step by step. Woo! I wanted to say the words for because I feel like it's, it's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, and it goes step by step, the longest march can be one, can be one. Many stones can form an arch, singly none, singly none. And by the union what we will can be accomplished still. Drops of water turn a mill, singly none, singly none. So I want us to join together and, and start to build our, join our voices together in, in this chant that's recognizing our power to be able to change the future. So it goes, ain't no power like the power of the people. Ain't no power like the power of the people. Because the power of the people don't stop. And the power of the people don't stop. Ain't no power like the power of the people. The power of the people don't stop. Ain't no power like the power of the people. The power of the people don't stop. Say what? Ain't no power like the power of the people. The power of the people don't stop. outside my comfort zone, so bear with me. I'm going to read a little bit of what I wrote. Woo, woo. Yeah. 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 Basically, uh, what we are, I'm an intern for SEAL, and what we are, we're a small, up-and-coming nonprofit organization, and uh, our goal is basically to lower the carbon footprint of 3,500 3, homes in the South Coast by 15%. So, yeah. how we do that is we offer no-cost home energy assessments, and we also offer options for solar. Uh, our core theme is basically build community, save money, and save the planet. You know what I mean? It's, Woo, uh, this yeah. movement is basically something that transforms a lot of people. Um, when I first got involved with uh, SEAL, uh, I got involved because I wasn't able to speak. I would never, ever do this. <laughs> Three and a half months ago, ever. Um, and basically, I started to learn things, things that matter. Um, I have children, so when I look across the street, because my children live down the street, he asks me all the time, it's like, what is that? I, I don't have an answer for him because he's too little to know what that does to people and who it affects. And it affects him and it affects everyone's children because we all have children. We have nieces and nephews. This is a movement that basically should be for everyone. Everyone needs to know about what's going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, three months ago, I didn't know anything about this, so don't think that, you know what I mean, this doesn't touch anyone. Ten years ago, I didn't think I'd have children because of society, because of everything, not just the, the weather because of me being a black man and everything you know what I mean life is is a hard place for a child to grow up in so I don't know I felt like I had to 
do something to make a difference for them, to be an inspiration to them. And, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things people can argue and fight about, but why not pick something good? This is something good. <laughs> we can fight about all types of things in the world, but this is something that basically is going to affect us. And not just the South Coast, not just everyone. So, I mean, it's just something that people need to pick up. Uh, as I said, 10 years ago, I didn't think I'd have children. They basically influence everything that I do. And now I have a cause to basically... I'm not going to be here tomorrow. This has nothing to do with me. I may not. Uh, I can't say I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but prom tomorrow's not promised. It's basically what I'm trying to say. But for them, they have years to go. They have children to have. Their children have children to have. This is going to be a movement forever, and I just basically wanted to say thank you guys for doing what you guys are doing because not too many people are doing it. People don't feel like they have a voice. Before this, I didn't have a voice, but now I can speak. Thank you, Diana, because Diana was the one who actually got me involved. Um, and thank you, Seal, and thank you guys. Thank you, Energy Exodus. Um, you guys have a good day and keep up the good work. challenge of our generation. Yeah. This is what America is about in the 21st century, is making the transition away from the energy of the past to the energy of the future, but not just that. Not just that. I'm here because I, I'm a long time, been a long time advocate for climate action. But my life changed on June 11th, 12th, and 13th in 2008 when Cedar Rapids, Iowa suffered a catastrophic flood. We had never been above 21 feet on the Cedar River at flood stage, and we went over 31 feet, flooding 5,000 homes, 1,000 businesses, churches, and nonprofits, virtually every major facility of city government, the police, fire, jail, courthouse, the library. And it was catastrophic. It caused $5 billion in damage. Thanks to the generosity of the people of America and the people of the state of Iowa and charitable help from around the world, we are recovering. But it is hard. There are real consequences. Uh, just this morning, uh, as my two children and I were, were driving down here for this event, heard on public radio the story about life after Hurricane Irene. Right? These disasters which are happening more often, more frequently, with more severity, have real consequences for real people. Um, people hear about uh, 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 people hear about uh, unrest in Egypt. Well, what was the source of that? In 2010, there was a major drought and heat wave in Russia that killed 50,000 people and required the grain trains to turn around. Well, where were those trains going? They were going to go to Egypt that led to food riots and years of instability in that country. The stakes on this issue are enormous. We are in the fight for, for uh, sustainability and survival for our people, and we need, we need to step it up. Now, I want to say something. None of us asked for this problem, right? None of us, the, the men and women working at Brayton Point Coal Generating Station did not ask for this problem. But now we have to see the problem and we have to act to deal with it. And that's what we need to do. We need to shut down Brayton Point. We need to phase out coal plants across our country. We need to stop fracking. And, uh, and, and we, need to, we need to end our dependence on oil. We need to do these things, and we need to do them now, at the same time that we prepare for more extreme weather in the future. Uh, we have to deal with that. Now I want to say one other thing. Uh, we are here on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And for most of us, uh, for most of us, that's a historical event that happened, and oh yeah, that happened, right? And Dr. King was a great person. Well, that wasn't the way it was at the time. There were people trying to tell Dr. King, don't have that march. Don't do this. Right? And he said, we're going to do it, and we're going to show America. And that was one of the moments at which Americans across our country saw what was happening and said, you know what? This isn't right. 
people have the capacity to change. Yeah. Americans yeah. have the capacity to change. Yeah. And we are going to change. And we are going to stop being laggards on the issue of climate change. Right. And we are going to lead the world. That is our mission for this country in the 21st century, is to lead the world into a new era of sustainability. And I am confident we are going to do it. Right. So thank you for being here. This is one short walk. And we've got many, many more miles to go beyond this walk. So thank you. Have a great day. And I look forward to visiting to as many of you as possible. give a, a shout out and a thank you to 350 Mass and a Better Future Project for imagining, imagining that a march like this could take place. Woo! Events like this take months to plan and we are so grateful to the entire leadership of 350 Mass and Better Future Project for making this march possible. Woo! And then I want to thank all of you for undertaking this march. Thank you for your time, thank you for your commitment, and thanks to your friends and loved ones whose support is making it possible for every single one of you to be here and over the mark for the next few days. Four years ago, some of us camped out on the Boston Common because Craig and Marla and Vanessa and other visionaries were already showing the kind of leadership that has brought us together today. Since then, we've peddled, we've picketed, we've paraded, we've petitioned, on behalf of our home, planet Earth. What a privilege it's been over these years to stand with this community of truth tellers. Yeah. 50 years ago today, Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. As you set off on this march, I want you to imagine the entire group of you pulling that arc and bending it to a just world where power is distributed, where basic human needs are met, where the gap between the rich and the poor is a fraction of what it is today, and where the gift of creation is restored. Is that too much to hope for? No. Is that too much to aspire to? No. Not if the name of the march is energy exodus. And exodus is a movement from one place to another, from one way of life to another, from captivity to liberation. So it was for the Hebrew people 3,300 years ago, and so it is for us today. We now stand a short distance from this coal-fired power plant. In a span of only 200 years, seven generations of humans have used about half the fossil fuel creation took 200 million years to make. Since Drake pioneered modern oil drilling in 1859, each generation has claimed much of this limited resource as much as it might need to fuel its insatiable desire for material growth. It's uncompromising insistence on convenience and its relentless addiction to mobility. The last time I looked, material growth, convenience, and mobility were not moral values. And exodus is a journey to reorient what we prize. We are part of a growing movement that values resilience in place of growth, collaboration in place of consumption, wisdom in place of progress, vision in place of convenience, accountability in place of disregard, and balance in place of addiction. While this march is inspired by the courageous moral giants such as Susan B. Anthony, Gandhi, 
Dr. King and Cesar Chavez, Bill McKibben reminds us that our movement is a leaderless movement because we recognize that the people have the power. And if our planet is to survive, the power will need to be redistributed from its current concentration in corporations. And that's just what 350.org's campaign to divest fossil fuel from fossil fuels is all about. A show of hands, how many of you have been involved either at your school or in your town or in your church in a divestment campaign? Please raise your hand. Thank you all because that is really hard work. I spent last Thanksgiving, thank you, I spent last Thanksgiving uh, writing, uh, uh, writing a resolution for our denomination, the United Church of Christ. Like many of you, I read Bill McKibben's article in Rolling Stone last August, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math, which is, in a way, quite simple. Fossil fuel companies own and have the right to tap five times the amount of carbon that is needed to wreck the Earth. If fossil fuel companies simply do what they say is their normal business plan, life as we know it will cease. Can we create the moral conditions that will cause those companies to leave 80% of the carbon reserves in the ground? Yes. Yeah. 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 I believe we can and we must. I believe that you and I, together with millions of others, have the power to revoke the social license these companies need to continue to wreck the earth. Since McKibben's article was published a year ago, over 470 universities, cities, towns, and now faith groups have initiated divestment campaigns, and on July 1st, the national gathering of our 5,000 churches in the United Church of Christ became the first religious denomination and the first national body to divest from fossil fuels. Of that vote, I received congratulations from Bill McKibben, from a Harvard Nobel Prize laureate, from the head of another denomination, and from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Never forget, in concert with other political and popular forces, you and I actually have the power to bend the arc of justice. That's what this march is all about. That's what the movement to stop the Keystone Pipeline is all about. That's what the growing massive divestment campaign is all about. Put it all together and soon, ExxonMobil will no longer be regarded as a prudent investment. Within our lifetime, mining coal, drilling for oil, mountaintop removal, and fracking will be as unthinkable as it would be to own slaves today. Massachusetts, which is across the river from the Brayton Point coal and gas plant, and we're marching all the way to the site of the Cape Wind project, proposed Cape Wind project. We're here to tell Massachusetts and the nation that we need renewable power right now, and we can't wait any longer, and that we need to shut down fossil fuel infrastructure if we want a chance at a livable climate. Woo! Woo! No, that's right.
But I don't even think, honestly, that it's not even something they consider at all. They're not. I mean, they, they might have political beliefs, I'm sure they do. Woo! Thank you. Kathy, do we have a bathroom situation? I thought I was going to try over there, but then we'd all be in the bathroom. We can make a PB and J, or you can grab a little. I might just, yeah, I might eat the inside of it. Hello. If you need a bathroom, they are letting us use the bathrooms in the restaurant, but please just do it a uh, couple at a time. Thanks. I'm just, my mode is to stop as many things in my mouth as possible. I thought I really...